We've seen in other areas of communication that we've looked at that there's oftentimes a process at work in these things, and, and listening is no different. Like many other areas of communication, there's a way that we break things down, a way that we uh, know that things typically happen, and we can examine and further understand the listening process by examining how it unfolds and what that process looks like, what, what it involves. And so what we're going to do in this video is take a look at one model of that process called the hurrier model of listening. It's not the only model of listening that's available. It's just the one that I prefer and the one I want to talk about and, and use so that we can further understand what's happening as we listen so that we can improve the different aspects of listening. So a, a brief reminder on what we mean by listening. Our definition of listening is that it's the active process through which we make meaning out of assess and respond to what we hear. We discussed that in another video. You can go back and check that out in greater detail if you wish, but that's what we're getting at when we talk about listening. And again, we briefly discussed the hurrier model in another video, but I want to spend a little more time talking about it in this video. So again, the hurrier model, just the, each of those letters stands for one aspect of the, the, the process here that we're going to look at. They're not in that order of H U R I E R. They're just there to help you remember the different, um, the different parts of the listening process. So let's examine each of these a little bit further. First of all, we have hearing. Hearing is an important part of the listening process. Hearing is not the same as listening. Of course, um, listening is, is much more, uh, full. And, and there's much more to it than just hearing, but hearing is an important part of that process. Hearing is the physiological aspect of listening. It's where those sound waves are striking your eardrums and, and resonating in such a way that it creates these um, senses that go to your brain and so forth. And then there's a whole physiological thing after that. And I'm not really uh, an anatomist or anything like that. So um, as you can probably tell, but uh, hearing is an important part. If you can't hear well, it's difficult to listen. If you have some sort of hearing loss or if you are in a situation where there's lots of noise around you, then you know that it's difficult to focus and difficult to pay attention and difficult to listen effectively when you can't hear. So hearing is not the same as listening, but it is an important part of the listening process. The next area we can get into with the hurrier model is, is what we know is understanding. And this is basically, are you speaking the same language? Are you able to understand the language that this person is using? Now, in a, in the broadest sense possible, that's, you know, are you both speaking English or are you both speaking Spanish or Chinese or, or languages that you understand in that regard, right? If you're speaking English and the other person is speaking Russian and you don't speak Russian, that's going to be an issue. Even though you can hear them well, if you can't understand what they're saying, um, then that's going to be an issue. But it doesn't just have to be a completely different language in that regard. Um, I, you know, I, our oldest son and, and nephew are engineers. And when, when we're together sometimes as a whole, as a whole family, if they start talking about engineering stuff, I am completely lost. They're both speaking English, but I don't speak engineering. That's not my area of expertise, uh, or anything close to it. So I have trouble understanding. And so I have to quickly kind of drift off and lose interest because I don't know what they're talking about. I can't understand. Uh, so we need to, to be able to speak the same language to make sure that we're on the same page and that we're able to understand one another. That's an important part of the listening process as well. Next, we could talk about interpreting. Uh, this is where we're starting to make sense of what the person is saying in terms of how does this fit into what we know? And uh, so we, we can hear them, we can understand them. How does this then fit into my experience with these things? How do I make sense of what they're saying? What's my definition of the things that they're saying? Any, any uh, connotative meaning, as we've talked about with language, uh, the denotative and connotative meanings. How does, how do I interpret this? How do I interpret what they're trying to, to say with this? Um, there's a lot of interpretation going on when we're in the hearing and the listening process, excuse me. So, um, there's a lot of interpreting, trying to make sense of and place what this person is saying within the context of, of, of our situation and of, of everything else related to, um, that, that environment and that, uh, that, that, um, exchange. Uh, the E then stands for evaluating. Here's where we get into the assessing. Remember, as part of our definition, we were, we we're assessing this information. So, you know, this goes beyond just understanding, just, just having a basic understanding and denotatively of what that person is saying. It even goes beyond connotatively interpreting what that person is saying, trying to, 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 to place it within the context of that exchange and of our relationship and so forth. 
into evaluating. Now we're assessing. Now we're 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 making judgments. We're uh, applying analysis to these things. We're, we're determining whether this is something that rings true or is uh, rings false to us. Is, is this important information? Is it not? So we're triaging information in this stage. So we're evaluating and assessing the information both in terms of validity and also then again, where does this fit in in terms of my life? How do I need to use this information? What value does it have for me? We're prioritizing it in that way. So um, we engage in evaluating and that's all kind of, you know, it's related but separate. Understanding, interpreting and evaluating are all part of that initial process. We hear things and then we, we do all these things. We don't consciously usually separate them out. They just all kind of happen at once. And so that's uh, those are all the important parts of the listening process, things that we go through uh, both psychologically, mentally, uh, even physiologically as we're listening is, is part of that hearing, understanding, interpreting and evaluating. We save the two R's for last. The first R is actually remembering. So remembering will take place in different stages and in different ways too. And sometimes we just need to remember things through the end of that conversation. If it's not really that important, but still we should probably remember it until we're done talking to that person. What's their name? What are they talking about? So we store it away just, to, you know, right in the front of our memory in the, under the very short term information. Other times we think there are things I may need to hold on to this, you know, if you're in a class and you're trying to remember things long enough for the quiz or the, the, uh, the exam or something like that, then you may need to remember it a little bit longer and hold on to that information in, you know, in a more intermediate sense so that you have it for the time period that you need. Other things you're going to want to remember for a long time, right? If you meet someone, you think, boy, this person is significant to me. This could be the one. Maybe this is the person I'm going to be with for a long time. Then you may want to remember what's their birthday. What's their favorite color? What's their favorite food? These are things we may want to hold on to in a longer term sense and even more important information than right. Or if it's for work, you know, we're prioritizing and triaging this information short term, intermediate term, long term, or even sometimes I don't need to remember this at all. This is complete nonsense, right? Um, so I don't need to hold on to it at all. But at some level, we need to determine, do I need to remember this? And then if so, how long and where should I store this? What effort should I make to remember it and so forth? But remembering is an important part of the listening process then. The final R then is responding. As we mentioned in the definition, again, listening is, is a two-way process. It's not a one-way street. It's a two-way process. So it involves both taking that information in as well as, you know, again, then understanding, interpreting, evaluating, remembering. All of those are more that, that direction of, of the incoming information. But we're also, we have outgoing communication as part of the listening process. Sometimes it's verbal. Sometimes it's nonverbal. Um, sometimes it's really brief and just things like, uh-huh, yep, go on. I understand. Sometimes it's longer responses. If we're offering advice or we're offering comfort, it could be longer, but, uh, and it could just be expressions, maintaining eye contact, facial expressions, gesturing, a touch, things like that. Those are all forms of responses that we would use that we need to choose and identify What's the most appropriate response for me in this situation? We'll have a whole other video on responding because this is such a critical part of the listening process. But responding is that that other piece. It's, it's the two way part of of listening that we can't forget about. It's not just a one way thing. It's a two way thing in our expressiveness and in both verbally and non verbally is an important part of our overall listening. Then again, underneath all this, we have this kind of current of, uh, you know, beliefs and attitudes and values and culture and experiences and interests and biases, all of this that we put together and we call the frame of reference, right? The frame of reference is a sort of filter. I, I think of it like a filter that exists between, you know, the stimuli that are coming in and your psyche. And, and so in the middle of that, there's this filter that, that is made up of all these things. It's all of our experiences, it's all of our, our thoughts and our beliefs and our biases and everything. Uh, so it gets kind of processed through that has to go through that before it gets to our kind of a kind of brain, right? Really. Um, and so that's how everything that we see and hear and, and experience takes on a different shade of meaning for each person, because we all have a absolutely unique frame of reference. And so when we're hearing, when we're listening, we also need to remember that, that we go through all the steps of the hurrier process but it's going to be deeply affected by our frame of reference at every part of this process. So, um, so we need to keep that in mind as an important element of listening as well.
So now we see that listening is a process. There's, there's a process that goes on um, through, throughout the listening uh, area. And these are each things then that we can identify uh, separately, really kind of, and say, okay, how can I improve my hearing? How can I improve my understanding? How can I improve my memory for these things? And we can improve on each different aspect of the listening process. If you have questions about the Hurrier model, about listening in general, about, about what happens and how it happens and how we can improve it, please feel free to email me. I'd love to talk to you about that. In the meantime, I hope that you will, next time you're listening, you'll think about, even after the fact, think about, okay, what were the different stages that took place here? And what could I have done better in terms of each of these things? Because that's really the first step of improvement is determining what each of these things are and how can I improve them as I seek to improve as a listener.